Uh, all information about me is on the slide, so I'm not going to waste time on that, and I'll tie straight into the previous presentation, which will be very handy. And what I'm presenting today is uh, a spot study of a complex site, uh, which is both uh, cover, uh, covers a long period of time. Uh, basically, uh, we can uh, we can argue from the earliest period of Islamic occupation in that particular area of Morocco all the way up to the 16th century where the site is completely abandoned and becomes capped. So this is the instance of a, of a closed, uh, entombed site. Uh, the site is however also one that uh, has a high visitability and visitation index thanks to the construction of a new highway interchange immediately to the south of it. And what I'm going to be highlighting today here are, we have heard a lot of material about successes in all of this work. I'm going to be highlighting the failures <laughs> to close the entire series. <laughs> so, uh, to tie into the previous presentation uh, and a number of the others, we can surely agree and argue that there are many different approaches to visualization and many different viewpoints. The viewpoint of the archaeologist, the viewpoint of the visitor, the viewpoint of the user, uh, and the viewpoint of the designer, of the creator of the site or the object. So in order to provide some sort of meta theory, meta model for this, I actually uh, stole shamelessly from quantum physics without the physics and without the math. And I went into, <laughs> and I went into a, a standard visualization of an anti de Sitter space, which are hyperbolic spaces that can be tessellated into essentially uh, equivalent squares and triangles. Technically, if you are inside of the space, all of those squares and triangles are identical. Okay, just like our identical array of possible representations, possible approaches, possible points of view. So each one of these cross sections of a hyperbolic space is a matrix of comparably justifiable representations. And of course, as our knowledge evolves, a time axis, represented here vertically, comes into play as our knowledge improves, uh, data is reassessed, uh, results are re-evaluated, or, or and we acquire further technologies to make better models. On the outside lies what I call the, the wonderland, uh, which in quantum physics is called a conformal envelope. The wonderland would be a situation where all data is known, all processes are perfectly documented, all sources are extant. We have perfect knowledge in the sense of an abstract economic and game theory model. And we all know how successful our economist colleagues are at predicting actual events in the real world economy. Quite frankly, it sucks. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, where would be my site within this meta theory conceptualization? It is a site on the, the southern shore of the Strait of Gibraltar. It is an extremely important site uh, with a lot of uh, transcultural translation problems because it is of equal importance to both uh, Islamic history and post. Islamic history and re what I would call reclaimed Islamic history. And as it was also one of the major uh, parts of embarkation for Islamic Jihad in the Iberian Peninsula, of course there are all sorts of ideological and religious complications with interpretation and representation and conveyance of information. So I'll avoid in this presentation using Islamic or post-Islamic or Christian and I'll simply be speaking of Portuguese and Maghribi periods. Uh, prior to the Portuguese period, which commences on the 18th of October 1458, when uh, this fortified city is conquered, uh, it's a tiny, tiny city, okay, it's a fortified town, small place. Uh, 
We are looking at a period where we have essentially no written sources and we have to rely on field data. So that is our field data period prior to 1458. Uh, the first form of fortification uh, dates to approximately 685, 686 Hijra, 1287 to 1291 common era. Uh, so the site could be represented notionally as situated in these ways within our entire city space model, with a break line uh, at the point between the period where interpretation has to rely completely and entirely on archaeological data alone, because texts are minimal. And suddenly we are then projected into the Portuguese period, where, as a matter of fact, written documentation is excellent, not even excellent, but almost super abundant, to the extent that it makes actual interpretation and visualization a little bit difficult. There is simply, as several presenters before me have pointed out, there is too much data to make convenient interpretation and visualization possible for the visitor of the site. So what are we looking at? This is the site. Uh, this is your rough impression of the fortification, and this is a schematic representation of our entire data array. Field data from 1974 through 1984, uh, approximately six excavation field seasons, uh, remeasured field data from 2010. Uh, in between that phase from 2003 to 2005, a meticulous reassessment of the written sources and the written sources here are a little bit unusual. Uh, one of the presentations before me dealt with uh, the entire uh, schematization, how do we represent or capture uh, not only the object, not only the site, not only its functions, not only its social embedding, but the actual intent of the maker. What was in the head of the dead people when they built this and rebuilt it and adapted it and transformed it further. And fortunately, and but also unfortunately, here we are privileged. We actually do have both sketch plans and written documentation of that envisages how for the Portuguese after 1458, how do we transform this Islamic fortification into something that we could use? And we have a written record of all the debates and all the, all the thought process, at least in a nutshell, concerning what goes into that. In other, other words, we have the, uh, the situation that could be comically summarized. Do we put it here, or do we put it here, or do we move over the, this over there, or do we just demolish this thing entirely and build something completely different? So. Now, what raises problems for us is that at no stage, no point in the entire process, has there been any effective communication, and that's where the failures come in, between archaeologists, historians, architects, and creators of the only, not virtual, but actually physical architectural model of the site. Not only that, but up until 2012, uh, the surrounding paleotopography and paleohydrology of the site, including uh, by the like six field season archaeological team, had not, surprisingly enough, I know it sounds shocking, had not been taken into consideration. <laughs> so, the result is that when you look at this 2012 vis visualization uh, by the Moroccan company Model Design, uh, you start detecting major problems even as you look at this conceptually very nice visualization. It is nice, it looks good in the exhibit hall, okay? Uh, you could argue that it conveys uh, a correct impression of the excavated areas, uh, the natural wooded area that still exists within the ambit of the walls and a general impression of the fortifications. But then uh, you begin to do what we did 
uh, with an re examination of the written records and a re examination of the paleotopography and the paleohydrology, and you start immediately going, oh, oh my goodness, this is not working out as well as was proposed. The river is too wide and does not match the written records. Uh, the orientation of the hydrological, main hydrologic channel in the river is completely wrong. We know perfectly well from written records, and those are cover a number of military operations in the area that can be analyzed in almost excruciating detail. Uh, we know that the river never came up to the town walls. All right. We know from design sketches that the entire sluice articulation uh, of the, between the moat and the river was completely different than what you see in the model. And in the model here, uh, the fortified passageway, which in Portuguese is called a curaça, a cuirass, uh, advances beyond the beach, far out, relatively far out, into the coastal shallows. But we know that no such thing occurred. That was not either what was planned, or what was built, or what was excavated. Uh, in the course of the 16th century. And we have perfect documentation from the 16th century telling us that, as a matter of fact, uh, the main problem in the entire area, uh, and the main reason why ultimately the site was abandoned instead of continuing to be defended by the Portuguese, uh, was a steady accumulation of sediment forming a large jutting and curving spit bar at the mouth of this tiny stream, relatively tiny stream, which had ultimately occluded whatever remained of the local anchorage, thus rendering it unusable and the entire position indefensible because it could not be resupplied. On top of everything, uh, until 2012, and that uh, of course creates a problem for visitor visualization, I'm here referring to, uh, to an episode when I was traveling through Portugal with a bunch of students and I'll tell you, I was going like castles, 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 I need to see another castle, I need to see another fortification. I'm a fortifications guy, okay? And uh, from some of the, some of the girls on, uh, in the group I was getting, I don't want to see yet another castle, it's just yet another pile of stones, it does not make any sense to me. <laughs> And I went, right, that actually is completely right. That is the mistake people like me are making. Yes, of course it does not make any sense to you. You have no military training, you have no reenactor interests, all right? And you cannot visualize inside your head from long experience the combat and tactical scenarios around that fortification as they would have been using different types of weapons from uh, uh, fortification artillery uh, to swivel guns, uh, to muskets, to crossbows, to bows, and so on. Yes, I know you can't see that. How people would have lived here, fought here, defended it, attacked it, and died here. All right. But it is only until 2012, it, is not before, it was not before 2012, that we started getting actual analyses of fields of fire from the different still intact parts of the fortification and an analysis of defensibility, possible approaches of, uh, of, uh, of attack, uh, uh, possible concentrations of forces for defense that could permit us to do what the last presentation before me stressed. The point of view of the individual, somebody standing in Tower XYZ on the wall and, and actually experiencing it and trying to deal with a wave of attackers given, given weapons at hand, etc., given a certain type of equipment and so on. I also pointed out to you the disconnect between the written sources and the archaeological material. Uh, technically, uh, as the six field campaigns were designed, they were supposed to take all the written information uh, into account. And uh, when Charles Redman published his uh, uh, conspectus of the excavation at Xarel Segir, uh, the book projects the impression that everything has been adequately covered. But in fact, it has not. Even the Portuguese tombstones recovered during the excavation 
uh, remained essentially unused in terms of data and still remain unused in terms of data in the, co in the local collections. Uh, because as it turned out, uh, the only person who could read 16th century Portuguese and who was on the team had quit early. And after that, uh, there was a disconnect between the American team and Portuguese historians. And nobody who could actually read 16th century either Portuguese handwriting or Portuguese epigraphy could be found and ultimately that part of the project was given up on. Now, why this site is a little bit special here, yes, and I'm going to advance quickly, why this site is a little bit special is that we have probably the cat's pajamas dream of in terms of what one might conceivably do with things at the junction interface between design, actual construction, and interpretation. In 1514, a team of Portuguese engineers was actually sent to the site, and they meticulously measured the entire thing. They conducted a complete detailed survey and recorded it, not in a plan, unfortunately, they recorded it verbally and brought the verbalizations down. But as they were professional engineers, they wrote it down in appropriate ways, very exactly, very meticulously. It is possible to connect the actual field measurements with the actual described measurements. Uh, but they, connect, uh, they wrote it down with their own purposes, their own visualization, quote, unquote, viewpoint in mind. And that viewpoint was, of course, that of an engineer who had to render accounts to the crown. And the crown was not, not even interested, to some extent, whether the place was laid out this way or that way, and whether it was defensible. It was interested in how much material did you put into those walls and how much that had cost. <laughs> so, the way it is recorded uh, is fairly difficult to interpret because the engineers were interested in wall volumes, in the calculations of the volume of masonry, and not in recording direct linear measurements that could be of use to a modeler. So you have to unpack mathematically their records of wall volume, which are cubic measurements, and unpack them into linears. Once you do that, fortunately, it matches up almost miraculously. I'm going to point out very quickly, as I'm working towards the, uh, the end of the presentation, uh, the problems that, we, uh, that then were created in a 2012 uh, Faculty of Architecture thesis. Uh, MA thesis done on uh, this small fortified area called the castle, all right, which was the former Islamic gateway, the Bab al Bahr, the Sea Gate, and the assumption was made, uh, ignoring the in the entire previous set of debates about the reconstruction of the donjon, uh, the Torre de Menagem, that was done at Asila. Uh, where this entire visualization, including the pitched roof, takes us back to Brown and Hogenberg, the Kivitatis of the published in 1572, but essentially based on sketches from 1507-1508. And that has been a sore point in Portuguese architectural visualization for decades now. Saying, oh, well, yeah, the Arzil Tower never had this pitched roof. It never had this type of battlements. Brown and Horgenberg just imagined this, and so on and so forth. And yet, without any warning, a tower reconstructed that way, a hypothetical tour de menage, a hypothetical donjon, uh, resurfaces in the 2012 thesis, basically enshrining ignoring the entire debate and enshrining the standard canonical Brown and Hogan visualization of Portuguese towers in Morocco uh, in a recent segment that completely misleads not only somebody who reads the thesis, but any modeler who might want to work from that without access to the actual hesitations that went on in this particular area among the planners, among the creators. 
Yes, do we put a tower here? Do we put it at the mouth of the Corasa so that it would control with its fire longitudinally and sweep with its fire the entire length of the diamond contraption? Okay, do we angle it this way? Do we angle it that way? And then you discover in the documents, no, they did not envisage anything rooked. They envisaged an elevated cavalier type artillery platform. All right, and we hit the snag in the 2012 model. They, it was actually ordered from Lisbon that all the old round towers, the Cubelos, around the medieval wall, should have their top parts chopped off. Because that stood completely in the way of, of the artillerymen up on the platform of the donjon. All right, and completely negated an effective defense of the walls. So, Ultimately, we come, uh, and that's my last slide, we end with words. How do we convey a cross-cultural and cross-design site like this to the visitor? If we put in place information panels, if we create an interpretation building where this will be described to the audiences, because we cannot assume only one audience here, all right? Uh, we will be dealing with a Lusophones, so the Portuguese speaking audience, possibly Spanish speaking audience, French speaking audiences, German speaking audiences, <coughs> English speaking audiences. That is trivial. What is not trivial? That in early 16th century Portuguese military architecture, the concept of a baluarte, which is span in a standard way translated into English as a bastion, has absolutely nothing to do whatsoever with classical. Angular bastion fortification a la Vauban, etc. All right. The Corasa can be translated in many different ways. Uh, it is an armored passage between two points, and if it has actual side apertures in the side walls uh, for uh, fire, okay, it is in fact what in the 17th and 18th century would have been called a caponier. All right. The uh, square additions that were made to the round towers. The Portuguese call them travesh. Typically trans translated into English as redoubt. But in fact, it is not a redoubt because they are attached to the wall and they control their feeds of fire in ways completely different from what an English visitor to the site, for instance, familiar with the events of the English Civil War in the 17th century, will think of as being the function of a redoubt. And same with all the other terms. So I raise to close my presentation, okay, and uh, here is just a bibliog short bibliographic uh, access point of interfaces to the main data. Uh, I raise the point also of words that we use in description of our visualizations in information panels, etc., will create certain prepackaged impressions and concepts in the heads of the visitors to our sites. All right. How do we resolve for the fact that different visitors from different linguistic groups and different professional groups, when upon seeing that word, that term, uh, on the information panel, in display, or whatever, may instantly have an image that they already are familiar with in their head, but that may not match at all the concept that we attempt to convey in the actual visualization or presentation. Thank you very much.